So when it relates to, to the left, right. uh, now I assume you're basically someone that comes from the left, right? I mean, from everything I know I about am you. I a classical you, liberal. You're a liberal. A I mean, classical in every, liberal. every, virtually every sense. Yeah. So I assume then also that you feel the same way I do, that it's your job to police them more than the right, right? Like for me, people always say to me, well, why aren't you attacking the right as much? And it's like, I, I am not part of the right. I do attack them. I, I've never, I don't think I've ever voted for a Republican in my I life. Have not. I have I'm not a fan of the Democrats. I'm not um, either. And I, I'm not a Democrat. I'm an independent. But, I, but for me to police the people that I'm not part of, you know, it, it just seems silly. I want to police my guys. Do you feel that? I mean, is that part of what you do? And I, I feel to me it's more germane in the sense that the left, the regressives, have taken over academia. They have literally hijacked the institutions, and now they're institutionalizing these policies, which are really rather extreme. By any and any any classical liberal would be horrified at what their speech codes, microaggressions, trigger warning. It's horrifying, yeah. and they're basically robbing a generation of people of the possibility of being able to think clearly and critically, and they're ever increasing the threshold, p people's threshold for what they consider to be offensive or the types of conversations they'll have is continuously dropping. So for me, it's personal only in that I have to deal with this every single day, and I, <laughs> right, I mean, it's, it's... It's the most personal thing, actually. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's endemic. Now, why, why don't you criticize the right as much? Well, I mean, look, I have criticized the right. You've criticized the right. Think about the type of criticism you have to label against a guy who is a bona fide... Can I swear on your show? Swear away, yeah. Everyone you, always asks me before they swear. I, I, prob have, I probably I should have, have asked nice. before Yeah, I, no, that's fine, that's fine. Yeah, I mean, think, think about, about, you know, like Huckabee, who's a bona fide fucking lunatic, yeah. right? I mean, think about guys like Donald Trump. I mean, these guys are so outside, not even the... Actually, that's... The sad thing is they're not outside the mainstream. At least of that place, yeah. Yeah, and labeling a sort of criticism against that type of crazy is very different from people for whom I feel sympathies for these impulses they have. They have very decent impulses at base, and we need to be careful that because they're so insincere and dishonest that we don't disregard their whole message. Like, we, we, the onus falls upon us to think clearly about that and to really, okay, privilege, I got it. You know, this gender thing, I got it. You know, but to really take a step back and separate the message from the messenger so that we don't discount the whole thing. Yeah, and I'm very, very aware of that all the time, you know, because I know that I'm attacking the trigger warnings and right. the safe space and all that stuff, and I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, and I know that there are legitimate racial issues and right. there are legitimate socioeconomic issues right. and all of that stuff, but because of the way these guys have behaved and framed the debate, they've made it extremely difficult to separate legitimate issues That's exactly right. from pure craziness. So I think what's interesting related to someone like you that comes from a place where you're writing and talking about moral clarity and, and critical thinking, this has to be, it, it's almost like doubly worse for you in a way to, to be part of this because there's the, there's the thinking part, there's the spiritual part, like it's, yeah. it's just a lot mixed into one crazy thing. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting. I mean, ev everybody who had, I think, Nick Cohen on here and other people have given genealogical accounts of how we got into this situation, but I, I think the thing that people really aren't thinking about or talking about that much are, what are the implications for these things? I mean, what are the philosophical... What is this... <clears throat> excuse me, what are this... What, I notice we're both speaking quickly. We have so much to say. Yeah, <laughs> go we ahead. so much go, to go, get go, up. Go, go, go. Um, what does this mean when we've created academic environments in which people, in which professors are terrified to give an, a dissenting opinion? And, and when I mean by dissenting, I mean something from, from the, the regressive party line. Right. What does that right, mean? Just for a second, yeah. let's define dissenting, because it's barely dissenting. It's literally just saying anything other. Yeah. Dissenting, it's not like you're saying something that's really against what the mainstream belief is. It's pretty much anything, like, you know, uh, be okay with someone else wearing a Halloween costume that you may right. not like. That's right. the sort of dissenting we're talking about. And that's the kind of craziness that you get when... I mean, you, so it's, again, the, the issue of how we got there is extremely interesting and valuable. I'm, I'm interested in... Recently, my work has been focusing on what does that mean for one's 
intellectual life. Like, what does that mean for one's ability to reflect on issues? What does that mean for one's ability to make decisions about things that really matter? Not Halloween costumes. I understand that some people think that matters, but that's just evidence of an inability to show moral triage, you know, to prior, to indexically prioritize, prior to high, some kind of a hierarchy to identify to one need as in another need and show why that's important. And the way that you do that is through reason and rationality. That's how you get there. And the, the way that you, so when you attack safe spaces and when you attract tr trigger warnings, you're actually, this is the key thing, you're actually doing them a favor because, because you're giving them an opportunity, you're giving people an opportunity if their values are true, like if their values are, are, are morally correct, and I do believe that there's such a thing as being morally correct, and obviously they do as well, sure. or they couldn't be espousing, and that's just parenthetically. That's the interesting difference between, <clears throat> that's the, the, uh, the contradiction in their beliefs between being, um, ugh, I lost my train of thought. Well, that I think, I think you're going, that they think that oh, they're yeah. so right. Yeah. yeah, so, so you, so, these people, they have the legacy of relativism, but yet the values that they put forth are radical egalitarianism. You cannot be a relativist and an egalitarian at the same time. You cannot say everything is relative and then all systems are equal. So one of the things that you're doing, you're doing, they'll look at it as to them, but I will look at it as to advance their cause. Yeah. One of the things you're doing is you're giving people an opportunity to reflect on how they know what they know. And the only way you can do that is through an unsafe space. The only way you can do that is to really take a look at these ideas and examine these ideas. There just is no other way. So if they have, their values are arbitrary and subject to cultural capriciousness unless they can be rationally derived. And they've taken out the engine of rationality once they've created spaces in which you can't ask these questions. Yeah, so that's why I, a few times, I'll say that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Right. That I believe that these guys, actually Joe Rogan fought me on this when I said this. I said I believe these guys like with the Affleck, thing on real time with Sam Harris and all that. I said, well, his intentions were good. You know what I mean? He was intending to try to protect the other. Joe basically was like, nah, he's a Hollywood guy, and then yeah. he's just protecting his that. own yeah, his yeah. own internal. He's an actor. He's an actor, and that's it, and he's, he's out for number one, fine. But I guess that's probably what really is perverse about what's going on on the left, because by taking kids, by taking college kids whose thoughts aren't fully formulated yet, and then putting this thing on them, right. they think they're doing everything for good intentions, but then they're gonna walk out into the world realizing the world doesn't really react that way. Yeah, and if they're listening to this and they're just dumping on you and hating you and hating me, I think it's perhaps a nice, helpful heuristic to think about it in terms of standing for the flag. An example on the right, the people on the right are big on the you know, respect for the flag, they've made their own things sacred, but I don't think that's important. I think what's important is to teach people why they should stand for the flag, what our values mean, and, and that's why they're standing. It's not an icon, but I think that the same property holds on the left. They have to, they have to start being honest and realizing that if their values really are true, then they have to subject those values to scrutiny. And then we have to create spaces, we have to create environments where the marketplace of ideas, we can have a discourse and right, a so dialectic we have about to do these the things. Reverse of what exactly. It's That's, not just a little different, we have right. to just do the Do the opposite. Reverse. That's why they should be thanking you. Yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm being facetious, I'm being really sincere. <laughs> yeah. That's why they should be thanking you. Yeah. Because if not, then that means their values are arbitrary. So when I talked about this with Milo and the, and the college thing, you know, he said that what this really is about, this isn't about left and right, he was saying that this really is about authoritarians versus that's the, sort of, that's and, the that's, and that's what you're yeah. really talking that's about. That's the horseshoe. Here. Yeah, so, so somehow though, I think this is related to, to religion too, right? It we is. can relate this very much to, Absolutely. to the thinking of religion, so can you go down that path for me a little bit? Yeah, so the, they use many of the same mechanisms. They have things that are sacred, in this case, it's the rise of the victim, the victimhood culture. They have certain questions, certain ideas can't be questions, can't be challenged. The churches are safe space, university campuses are safe space. And, and so here's what's super interesting. 
when I did a talk a few years ago, uh, I don't know, five years ago, I don't even know, it's on YouTube. Jesus, the Easter Bunny, and other delusions just say no. Yeah. I don't know if you saw that or not, it doesn't matter. But, but the, the people who protested that were not Christians. I had some Christians come in the audience. I, I speak all around the world. People are, in general, with very few exceptions, Christians and Muslims are very civil. To Christians, I go out for a beer often afterwards. But it's the regressive leftist who, I mean, this, I mean, really think about this. This is, this is like the, the feminist, is what I said to Joe today. It's like the feminist in bed with the Islamists. Yeah. It's, I mean, it, it, you just could not conceive of a relationship that was more antithetical to, to, to one, one of those parties' interests. <laughs> right. right. So, so it's interesting that... that and I'm pretty sure that the, the Islamists know uh, that they're never going to treat these women any better, right? It's, so what is that? What is that? I'm sorry to cut you off, but what is that? that the, uh -huh. What are they doing? So they just view, so these feminists for whatever, yeah. they just view the other as more oppressed than they are, so they just have to give them their cred? I mean, is that is Boy, it really that simple? Or? That is a comp. I have thought about that a long time. I think it deals with the color of people's skin, oppression. I think it deals with... You know this whole third wave feminism that I still don't understand. <laughs> uh, I, I I don't know. I don't. I cannot explain to you, and I've thought about it extensively, how this um, cohabitation, not, not a marriage, but yeah. how, how this how this bizarre relationship came to be. I still cannot understand it. And the most recent event at Goldsmith that Dawkins was tw tweeting on and such. I mean that is. That should be a case study for people. The, uh, that is even boggling my mind to even think about trying to understand that. Right, and then, so that, and, and all of this, and all the stuff that we're talking about in this discussion, it shows, again, why, that if you don't help the reformers, the actual reformers who are trying right. to change, make things better for women and gays and minorities. Unquestionably. If you don't help these people and you keep framing these people as the problem, right. Well, what do you do? You get the rise of Trump. Yeah, yeah. I'm just going to say that extreme. I think my tweet was something like, uh, if if you have create environments in which you can't ask questions, extremists step in with solutions. And I think yeah. that that's exactly right. Could this? So really, could do you think that this atmosphere that that Trump has taken advantage of? There, there. I, I uh, sense a palpable fear right okay. now in America that I haven't felt before. Yeah. I really do. I sense that people are feeling like everything is screwed up. That yeah. there's, we have this terrorism stuff. We don't know what the answers are. There's this refugee thing. We're all children of refugees right. or descendants of refugees here, unless you came over as a slave or uh, an American Indian, right? If you were actually indigenous to this land. Um, and I just have this sense that people don't know what's going on. And then when you shut down the people on the left, exactly right. try, then of course Trump. Yeah. Okay, so I really wish that every single person listening to that would put the rewind button and listen to that again. So if you're one of these people who thinks that you're doing the world a favor by creating, you know, triggering, protecting people who are, you know, you want to protect the sensitivities of others, again, not a bad impulse at all. But the consequence of that is that people become less capable of making discerning rational judgments, particularly in the moral sphere. So the consequence of those things is that Donald Trump is right there with the answer. And I just read a piece about the number of people who, who support Trump who won't admit it is far higher, which is terrifying. And no. we know that the way we don't want to create adversarial relationships, I mean, if so I think that part of this problem I don't want to go down this rabbit hole necessarily, but part of this problem is we have to engage Trump's arguments on his own terms. And part of that is if the idea is that, that this is going to make America safer, I think that's what we should, we shouldn't appeal to patriotism. We should, we should take a look at that. I don't think that claim is true. I don't think that's borne out by the evidence. I don't think there's any reason to think that, first off, it's not even constitutional, any of the keeping people out based on religion or, but we or can any just, of that we stuff. Just hand, we can accept, we, we can just bracket that. Yeah. And we can just look at, okay. What is the consequence of this? And, you know, what is the con? Well, let's see. Well, what is the con? You think that Muslim, Muslim, uh, Islamic, again, so yeah. we need to... So what you're, the you're getting caught in words. Even this, isn't that the crazy thing? Yeah. They've made us all so crazy about words that whatever you were about to say there, you had to think about it 18 different ways, even though you're sitting across from somebody that you know is okay with... The, the, right. the idea of what you're going to talk about. Yeah, I, right? I was I was caught because I said, okay, well, we should have defined the terms. You know, yeah. Islam is the religion, the belief, the ideas. So, and and Muslims from the people. Muslims right. of the people, and right. it. 
for some reason, that seems to be an unbelievably too, way too complicated for people to understand. I don't understand so why So what do you think that is? Because it, and it also seems like they can only do that with Islam. Like, the issue yeah. only seems to be with Islam, because if we were to say anything about Christianity... People would be saying, great job. They'd Thank be you. applauding. You guys are awesome. All day long. Or if you say anything about radical Islam, they'll right. say, well, the Crusades. Right. And, which is right. a... Ah. Right, right. Go. So that, so you did it. Okay. So that's right because that's. Remember, I said the the values they hold are egalitarianism and relativism. For them, in their minds, egalitarianism. Look, every age has had a dominating value. And Aristotle he talks about the Aristotelian gentleman. In Homer, it was strength, and Voltaire it was humor, and. Now it's it's in one side it's egalitarianism and relativism. For, for them, everything has to be relative. It's like the the the. Uh, Excuse me. The default is relativistic uh, and and egalitarian. So, well, they have their bad guys, but you have your bad guys. I'm um, actually no. The, actually, those things are not morally equivalent. Mm -hmm. And so, so you asked the question, which is uh, pertinent, and it it's one that should be explored. Like, what is that about? I think part of it is that we've extended the the umbrella of rights uh, wider and wider. And I, I want to be crystal clear that I'm I'm being descriptive and not evaluative. I'm describing the state. I'm not saying it's good or bad. You know, I, I was just uh, at a, a restaurant with my buddy there before we came here. And, you know, I don't eat, um, I try to eat only cruelty-free meat. So I won't eat, and that's cool. So we've now extended the umbrella of rights to, to animals, right? So that is constantly extending. So the next step for some people is to extend that to ideas. We've extended that. And, and I and I think ah, that's really interesting. Wait, you got to yeah. Gotta, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, I want to sort of get in that for a second. So yeah. we've extended the ideas of rights, which used to be for people, now to animals because we want to treat animals better. Minorities. And you're saying the next yeah. version of that will be with ideas. Yeah. So we're going to sort of take, we're going to put on even softer gloves when it comes to ideas because even that should be held. In some sort of yeah, because way. people, as I said in my TAM talk, ideas don't deserve dignity. People do, and it's kind of become a meme. But it's true. It's it's that it, it's just the next kind of radical taking that idea and extending it further on. Yeah. And the problem with that is that you do a disservice to those people holding beliefs because you don't respect their beliefs to engage them enough. That's the other thing that's really not talked about. This whole enterprise is really one of disrespect. They're, they're trying to engender these values of respect, but not listening to people, not engaging people, people's ideas, even, you know, you've talked about in your show the soft bigotry of ex low expectations. I mm -hmm. think it was Bush's phrase. And, and, and I kept crediting Bill Maher, which at least sounded nice. Now I'm, I'm quoting George W. Bush. I don't know how I feel about it. Well, that. I don't know. So then so, you'll so be I'm, a neocon, right? Then, right, then you'll be, now, now everybody's going to gang up on us because they're going to say, look at you guys, you really love Bush deep in your heart. Yeah. No, that's actually not true. <laughs> that's just a fabrication. That's the kind of mental gymnastics people need to do to keep their ideological biases in place. Yeah, well, that was one of the things, you know, when we launched the show on Aura, Sam was the first guest, and he said that they're always looking, that these people are always looking for exactly. something in you. Not that you've said this opinion or that you've shared this idea, but if they can somehow link together something that gets them to where they want you to be, right. you're out. Yeah, and just think about this kind of person. Think, think about discharging that impulse that you have. Think about the kind of person that you are. I, you know, it, it's difficult for me to say without without being overly harsh, and it's an example of a time when someone ought to be overly harsh, but that makes me feel really sad for somebody. Yeah, well, that's that's very much how I feel out of, uh, out of all of this, because, look, I can barely speak when I'm saying it, because this, this situation has cost me friends and relationships already, and I've only been talking about this stuff for a couple months, and, so and I see the way people have turned on me, and I, I've gotten into bit debates with friends and said, can you point me to where I've said what you're accusing me of? Yeah. And they, they never do, because they can't. So that's a, that. So, so if I may ask you, Please. what is the point of contention? You lost friends. Is, was it an issue? Was it a suite so of someone issues? Someone who exists in the world that we exist in, that's yeah. a public person, uh, who I no longer talk to anymore, who's been a good friend of mine for the last couple of years, said that my whole show now is about bigotry to, to Muslims. And I said, it's actually the complete reverse. Exactly. I'm trying to separate people from the ideology. Right. I'm trying to show that 
not everyone believes this. I've brought on people repeatedly to talk about tolerance. Right. You know, the way they'll frame, they'll say Sam and Majid that they're, uh, that these are the bigots. Their book was called, was about Islam and right. the future of tolerance, right. not Islam and the future of nuclear war. You know, so, so it's it's these mental gymnastics, as you just said. So, what would that person like you to do? Not talk about it, I suppose. Not talk about these important issues. Okay, but then but it, I'm not going to do that. That right, but then again, that that goes back to what we started the conversation with. Then that's why you get Trumps. Yeah, exactly. So I don't. I I would ask them. So that's kind of the defeasibility test that I talk about in the book, and the app has the defeasibility test. It's under what conditions do you think that that belief would be false? Yeah. So you can use. It doesn't have to be religion. You can use the defeasibility test. This is not my idea. It's Matt McCormick's. You can use the defeasibility test with anything. So uh, under what conditions could I demonstrate to you that I am not a biased against Muslims? If they say to you, well, there are no conditions, well, that's well, a type then, of belief closure. There's, then there's, there, there almost is no conversation. Then you have to take a step back and, I hate to say this, but to the meta level and have a conversation about that. Right. Um, but, but I think that, I don't know, I'm now, now I'm kind of ideating. I think I'm like concerned about your friendship with this person. <laughs> I mean, I've given up, basically, because once, because after being called a bigot repeatedly and saying, actually, no, and can you point me to any... Right. I, I know I'm not a bigot. Right. You know, uh, Douglas Murray said something really interesting on Sam's podcast. He said, I have no time anymore for people whose intentions are not good. You know what I mean? So I know I'm not a racist. So if you want to call me a racist or call me a bigot, it actually, since I'm not, it actually, I don't like being called yeah. a racist or a bigot, but it doesn't really have any meaning because it's just a word. If I was secretly a racist and you were calling me a racist, I suppose right. I would struggle with it a little bit more, but I'm See, not. So that's that's the hard thing about, that's that really is difficult about dealing with people who are insincere. And I think a lot of those attacks on Sam, like I, in philosophy, there's this thing called a hermeneutic of charity. You want to give everybody a charitable interpretation. And you want to say, okay, these guys actually believe this stuff, you know. <clears throat> but over time, you just have to grow up. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I hate to say this, I, and I don't hate to say this because it's, I should have woken up to this conclusion long ago. I don't think these people are sincere. No, I, I don't think so at all. But that's hard to grasp, too. Right? It is hard to grasp because if they thought they had the truth, why wouldn't they be sincere? Yeah. So, <clears throat> excuse me, that's, that's the thing that kind of keeps me from going on a full throttle attack. I mean, maybe the, their cognitive software has somehow been hijacked by this moral, this idea that they think that they're defending the downtrodden and you know this we, you know we need to to do this as an example it's okay to do this because we're serving some you know there's some utilitarian calculus like oh it's going to be in the greater good so i don't know what goes through their minds but that's the problem with dealing with someone who's insincere yeah so i do think that i think that they think and maybe I, I, i'm probably giving them the the leash that they wouldn't afford me, right. right? But I do think they think, as Majid said, he, th he said they think that they're in a war. Right. So they're gonna use whatever tactics they have. What I find particularly odd about it is that now that we live in a digital age where everything is recorded and you can be quoted, you know, talking to this person about this or this person about that, even when they're confronted with new evidence That's or right. confronted or exposed as frauds, they just double down even more, which is incredible. Yeah, so so I share your frustration, and I'm sympathetic w with it. Um, I don't know. I, I would. I would. I mean, I mean, hey, look. I you know, I'm just. I'd call your friend again and say, hey, look. I've been thinking about this. Let's have a talk. I mean, I wouldn't let that friendship go because that's not well, like. I tried to get them to sit down. We did this over text. They wouldn't even sit oh, down. Okay. With me. I mean, they we, wouldn't even sit wouldn't down. Wouldn't even sit. Let's get okay. coffee. We've been but that's yeah. that's again part of the regressive left, yeah. right? They don't want to have conversations. They they want to end those conversations. And ironically, they they turn that against us and say, "Well, look, you guys are the ones who don't want to have conversations." And I, look, the whole problem. This is the schism and liberalism, right? Yeah. And it was made can, naked on the Bill Maher show with Ben Affleck and Sam. And w th this is something. Again, to solve these problems, we need to be on it. We need to, to, to be forthright. We need to be honest. We need to create environments where we can talk about the problems. And almost, if you were to, again, create a list of how not to solve your problems, these people have it. I mean, they've done a perfect job. Yeah. You know, what's amazing to me also is that I never mean to go this deep into it. Even, yeah. I, I really wanted to focus more on atheism. Oh, sure. And I'm, I'm happy, yeah. I'm, we're going to go there now, and yeah, I'm, hap yeah. I'm happy to do this. But what I think is particularly fascinating about this is that everything else 
that we talk about and that we're going to talk about is so related to this. That's right. why this, this whole situation has been so bananas, because this schism has exposed something that I think people didn't really realize. But let's, let's just leave that portion there, unless you want to give me a closing no, statement I, on that, and then no, we'll come I, to atheism. No, it, it, atheism is fine. I just think that we, this is not a very hopeful time right now, you know? I mean, we're dealing with very serious ecological issues, and we have people who are apologists for big oil companies and denialists, you know, deny anthropogenic global warming. And again, I actually do think those people should be given a seat at the adult table. Any, anybody who has a view different from my own, as long as they provide evidence, is welcome to have a conversation. I, I think that there's something that's morally damaging about what the regressives are doing, and I think people have had enough. Yeah. I have had way more than enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and I think now, like yeah. your your show has really caused this catalyst, almost this cascade of people who also feel the same way, and their like minds are gravitating, uh, and they've they've really robbed us of any idea of hope that we have because we look at the the presidential campaign, and I it's just holy moly, yeah. I mean, I look at the Republicans, and I think. Wow, like any one of those people would be an unmitigated disaster.